يبدأ مؤتمر ووفل ومن اون ذا فرونت لاين بنسخته السادسة مع الحلقة الأولى تحت عنوان النساء الدبلوماسيات إشراك المرأة في القيادة السياسية ومن دبلوماتس إنجيجينج ومن إن بوليتيكال ليدرشيب وندعو إلى المنصة كل من هير إكسلنسي بيرنيل دالير كارديل يو إن أندر سكرتيري جنرال إند سبيشال كوردينيتور تو لبنان Her Excellency Monica Schmutz-Kirgoz, Ambassador of Switzerland to Lebanon. Her Excellency Emmanuel Lamoureux, Ambassador of Canada to Lebanon. Her Excellency Christina Lassen, EU Ambassador, Head of Delegation to Lebanon. يدير هذه الجلسة المتحدس الرسمي السابق باسم جامعة الدول العربية وعمل رئيس بعثة الجامعة الدولة جامعة الدول العربية في فرنسا والمندوب المراقب الدائم للجامعة لدى منظمة اليونسكو الدكتور نصيف حتى. تفضل. I think we are on time. We we'll try to catch up uh, for 10 minutes. Let me say first uh, how much uh, I appreciate, uh, dear May, what you're doing and what your association is doing in the presence of uh, distinguished uh, personalities. I see there is an imbalance, more ladies than gentlemen. So this time it's for gentlemen to ask sometimes for their rights in this respect. The issue in front of us today with four distinguished ambassadors, ladies, is extremely important. I would like to put a couple of questions. First question will be, of course, why have you chosen this field of work, Sumitye, which is very important. Of course, I remember always what Jacques Attali has said that in a globalized world, we are all modern nomads today. But diplomats are born to be modern nomads. So what's your first reaction to that? Then I will put one or two questions in general to reflect on diplomacy, the work of diplomacy, and the work of ladies in the uh, public uh, sphere. I would like only to say something, how proud I am as a Lebanese to say that two days ago, we had 25 candidates accepted as new diplomats to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and among them, we had 17 young ladies and eight young gentlemen. So basically, we're very proud of that, and <laughs> I couldn't resist but saying it. I will start, I think, in the order I was given, Her Excellency, Ambassador Cardell, if you tell us, and then we proceed, what made you choose this nomadic, word nomadic career? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Good. Dr. May, thank you so much for including me in, in, in this really important discussion. Two things actually motivated me. One thing was the desire to see the world and desire to explore different cultures, and that has really been a motivating factor. The other motivating factor was that I come out of a family that has always had in its bone to try to make a difference, to try to make the world better, to try to make it a more peaceful place. So during the Second World War, my family was involved in the resistance. Since then, a, a part of building up a strong uh, society, taking care of those who were not as well off, etc. And I'm absolutely sure that that has inspired me too. Thank you. Ambassador Gigos. Well, thank you so much. Do I have to push the button here? Uh, shouldn't, right? Oh, no, no, no. Here. Thank you so much. I mean, what you said, my dear colleague, is of course true. There is always this wish of discovering the world more, but I think me being Swiss, there were some other factors who pushed me to this career. Um, you might know that I'm born without any civil rights, and I'm the only one here on the panel. Um, the last Swiss canton having been forced by the federal court in 1991 to finally grant the women the right to vote. So, um, <laughs> and it's true. I, I, I know that sometimes, you know, it gets forgotten. So it has been granted on a federal level in 1971. Encore plus. So it was quite difficult. So let's say I, I probably come from the most conservative and patriarchal environment from all my, all my colleagues here on the panel. 
And when I finished high school, you know, there was this high school newspaper and they would ask us all, what do you want to become? Where do you want to end up? To end up? And I, I, I wrote there, you know, I want to become a diplomat. And they were all laughing, including my teachers who said, well, you are actually a very good student, but you are a woman. You know, why would you ever write you want to become a diplomat? And it was not so wrong what they were saying, because women were admitted to the diplomatic service in Switzerland since 56, which was long before we got civil rights. But until 1990, women could not enter the diplomatic service being married. Um, so there were a lot of, of discriminatory measures, and I think this is one of the reasons that pushed me even more to, to get into this career, which is a beautiful one, and I'm sure we're going to talk uh, later about how you can change the world as a woman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Lamoureux, proceeding as the list, then we shift. Is this working? Yes, it is. Um, so in my case, I would say I was a, I was a late bloomer. Uh, I went through many, uh, many interests uh, before discovering diplomacy. Uh, I was initially destined to be a, a journalist. That was my initial uh, training. And through journalism, I discovered uh, the beauty of travel and new cultures and international affairs. And that eventually uh, led me to, uh, uh, to diplomacy. But I also had a profound interest in uh, public service. Uh, I was, from a fairly young age, uh, very cognizant of the fact that I was privileged. I, I lived in Africa as a child. And, uh, and I had a, a willingness to, I guess, give back uh, something to the world. And so I, uh, when I started uh, getting interested in international affairs, in fact, it was development studies uh, that, uh, that interested me the most. But, uh, you know, sometimes life uh, has uh, surprises for you. And of course, I ended up working mostly uh, on multilateral and security issues, which is completely different. So, you know, as women, our interests and, and careers and, and path will change. And I think uh, I owe my current career to a certain uh, openness to change and, uh, you know, certain flexibility in, in what, uh, with respect to what uh, uh, life uh, brought my way. Thank you. <laughs> Ambassador Lassen, the floor is yours. Thank you. And Ambassador Hedy, can I just say, it's actually kind of refreshing to be in a setting with an unbalance in, in respect to women, because in our business, I think we are almost always in the other situation. So sometimes it's <laughs> nice, actually, with all respect to our male <laughs> colleagues here, it's nice to see so many women out here today. I think, I mean, somehow we're, we're not so unique in how we choose this uh, career. Uh, my own experience sounds very much both like Penele and Monica and also Emmanuel. Uh, something, I was about 15 myself when I decided I wanted to become an ambassador, having no clue what that meant. <laughs> but I think very much the same drivers uh, and motivation as Penele was also mentioning. There's one big urge to discover the world. Obviously you want to go out, you want to live in many countries, but you can also become a tour guide, a tourist guide if you want to do that. I think the second uh, big motivation is that having that also uh, uh, maybe uh, idealistic and somehow what naive urge to also change the world and think that you can actually make a difference. And that's why uh, we go into public service basically. Uh, and that's why I think also we see increasingly more women uh, luckily in, f in public service, including diplomacy. And, uh, but it's interesting, as Monica was saying, it's not so long ago that this job that we're in, this business, was very much seen as a man's world. And we all had different restrictions in our countries for what women could actually do in diplomacy. And in that sense, I'm very encouraged what you're saying, Ambassador Hidi, about the high number of women who just entered the Lebanese Foreign Service. But as far as I know, you actually still has to have this law in Lebanon that to enter the Foreign Service, to become a women, woman diplomat in Lebanon, you're not allowed to be married at the time of your recruitment, I think. Which uh, means that you can basically get married the next day after you're hired. So it seems like one of these things that is maybe a little bit outdated that I hope uh, we've all had mm. similar things in our system, but that's one thing that would be great to change at some point. Thank you, it's gonna change just that way. <laughs> and uh, then I go to the second question and I perhaps I would reverse the order to have more comments and you'll have another question. My second question focuses on the following. Did, have your expectations being met and what are the key challenges? Of course, I understand the diplomatic constraints that you can talk about in terms of key challenges, how to address these challenges from your rich and enriching parkour. 
Pastor Lassen, who is that, by the um, I think as any other um, business, there's, of course, certain challenges. I think uh, our work is very much about uh, somehow, uh, of course, uh, first and foremost, it sounds uh, maybe bad, but it's a good thing protecting our own nations, in my, in my case, uh, European Union's uh, interest. Uh, but those interests uh, can be something that we all see as a global common good, like uh, promoting peace and democracy, human rights all over the world. So in that work, you have, of course, a challenge is to try to get your, uh, get your um, opinions and standpoints across the board, uh, forging compromises, uh, but of course also ultimately uh, working for a better world. And I think that's one of the challenges. And in that sense, one thing that's of course a challenge for all of us, especially those of us who are impatient, is you need patience. Uh, diplomacy is something uh, where you need, uh, obviously, where things can take many years to get to the, to the uh, result that you want. And I think, obviously, uh, diplomats who've been working in the Middle East and some of the conflicts in this region uh, have had to, over the years, uh, show a lot of patience uh, to try to get to the result that we all want, which is a more uh, prosperous and, and peaceful region. Uh, so obviously, there are, there are many different re challenges also in the daily work, but I think those are some of the main ones. Thank you. Ambassador um, Lamoureux. So I'll take your question from a slightly different angle. Uh, I will say that career-wise, uh, I'm extremely uh, satisfied. It is a, a very rewarding career and I consider myself quite lucky to be in that position at a relatively young age. Uh, before uh, before I, I, I left uh, Canada to be posted here, I told uh, my minister that, that I thought I had the best job in the world and I, I still think so. Uh, I wanted to focus on challenges more from a, a personal perspective. And I've seen a lot of change uh, in, uh, in Global Affairs Canada, in my department, and in my government since I joined, not that long ago, uh, almost uh, 18 years now. Um, first of all, when I joined, we had very few uh, models of women leaders in the department. We had some, but there was no diversity. So I couldn't find a female leader in my field I could truly identify to. There were some great female, le female leaders, don't get me wrong, but they had either abandoned the idea of having uh, a family and a career, or had found a partner who had simply abandoned his own career to support them, which is wonderful. But the, the idea of a, a, a couple, uh, uh, with the two members of the couple leading a satisfying career and with children was not existent. Uh, and uh, that has changed. Uh, we're starting to see at Global Affairs Canada and in the government of Canada in general, many very accomplished women who have married similarly accomplished men and uh, uh, have uh, you know, a family. In fact, we have a, a member of parliament who is going on parental leave uh, very shortly. And it is very encouraging to see that you don't need to choose. You always have choices to make, but it is no longer necessary to choose between career and family. And so for me, I think that was a challenge when I joined, and I think we're surmounting that at the moment. And it's, it's quite important, because that's the reason why many women do not want to uh, uh, enter the public service, including as politicians, because they view the sacrifices are too, as too uh, unsurmountable, and, and they should not be, for men and for women, quite frankly, uh, because I think men should also be allowed to have a family life and a personal life. Thank you. Ambassador mm -hmm. Thank you. So my expectations have been met, yes, absolutely. And I was a little bit harsh on my beautiful but uh, yet very conservative uh, country, but I have to say we achieved a lot. We achieved amazing things, you know, when it comes to gender issues in, in only 40 years. So I can say that my expectations career-wise have been met, and I'm, I'm very glad to speak after my friend Emmanuel, actually, because this shows that Canada is still a step ahead of us. I think we do not yet have a lot of role models, I have to say. And uh, I think it's good to be personal. I think I was the second um, Swiss diplomat that had children. 
um, and it was challenging, it was not easy, it was very um, inconvenient and I think it was even to a certain extent disturbing for my male colleagues to see this pregnant, uh, I was spokesperson of the ministry by then, to see this pregnant um, um, spokesperson. Um, then I think of course the ideal world is that you have two careers, uh, yet in, I think in the Swiss Foreign Service you don't really have um, female ambassadors who have a man who could maintain his career and there is always, I think, and this goes to our partners who, to our male partners who help us so much, at least in Switzerland, in this career, most of them had to step back in their own wishes um, to, to have, to have a, a continuous career. They, they, they help us, they sustain us and they have to invent uh, themselves all the time, actually every four years. And, and, and do a lot in children education, I have to admit, in my personal case. We need to devise a formula of balanced uh, yeah. sacrifices, <laughs> in exactly. a way. Yeah. Ambassador Cardin. Thank you. Oh, oh, balanced joys, <laughs> uh, I would say. It's a balanced choice, actually. Isn't it? Absolutely. Isn't it? You asked whether balanced it had priorities. Been, yeah. You asked whether it had been fulfilling. Um, I started out wanting to change the world and be a part of changing to this world to a more peaceful place. And um, um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Good, thank you. No, I, I started out uh, wanting to change. Better now? Yeah, now you can hear me. Thank you. No, I started out uh, uh, wanting to, to be a part of making this world a more peaceful place, a better place to live. And I couldn't ask for more than having the job I have right now, working for the UN, working in the field, working in this beautiful country in order to further that normative agenda. I've always believed in the UN. Um, and, and to have a chance then to be a part of the UN now is absolutely fantastic. So it's been a, a really fantastically fulfilling. You're asking about the challenges, and I would put the words perception that that has been the biggest uh, challenge on the way. When I started in the Danish Foreign Service uh, almost 30 years ago, it was really, really difficult to be accepted as a professional woman uh, in that Foreign Service. Um, and it is, and I, when I had my first child um, out on posting, I think I was one of the first having a child on posting and I was being accused of abusing the system and what have you. Things have changed, but it has been a long, steady change. But the issue around perception still continues and, and all over, I think. And that's one of the things we are up against. What can women do? What can professional women do? What can we do when we are out there? Um, when, when uh, in my previous job for the UN in Afghanistan, I was the first woman in that job, uh, being being the deputy uh, special representative out there and leading the UN's political work there. And when I came out there, I came into a culture where it was obvious that as a woman, there was a lot of things I couldn't do. I couldn't talk to warlords. I couldn't really negotiate the tough places. There were many places I wouldn't be able to go. And it turned out to be so wrong, but of course you're up against that perception all the time. I think I ended up with a better relationship with the warlords than my predecessor, exactly because I'm a woman, depending on how you, how you deal with it. But, but, um, and, and similarly also, I had access to the other side, the 50% of the population that my male colleagues did not have access to. And what did, why did that matter? I think again also on perception, when we are working towards a more peaceful and prosperous world, and we want to hear women's voices and why that is important. One of the things I felt I could be a part of when I, when I was appointed ambassador was exactly to bring women's voices to, to the table. I did that uh, with women ambassadors. Um, in, uh, we were all accredited to the African Union and we brought the voices of the women of Suzanne and South Sudan to the, uh, to the negotiating table when they were not there. The same on Somalia and the same in, in Afghanistan, bringing the women's voices into the peace process. Uh, made a real difference in terms of substance of, of what then was there, paying attention to, to the children, paying, paying attention to health, pay, paying attention to, uh, uh, to education. And also, they were not former warlords. They wanted peace. So they brought a different, different voice to, to the peace table. And I really think that, you know, as a, as a woman in the profession that I am, one of the things that I can do is to use that to bring some of these other voices that we need for peace in this world to the table. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Let me put the last question, and uh, as we say, we live today in a world where public diplomacy is becoming no less important than official diplomacy, addressing uh, opinion makers, opinion shapers, informal, who happen to be later, formal decision makers. Here we need to know, or to have the smell of the street, as the American would say, and to understand in a more nuanced way the conditions, the cultural conditions in which we are functioning. 
uh, what is uh, your advice that you would give uh, to women and to men? Definitely, I don't want to keep this mm -hmm. division going on. Joining the public sphere, whether in diplomacy or other aspect of public sphere, based on your lessons and based on also your suggestions from your day-to-day -day learning, and particularly with a very fluid and changing set of priorities in a, again, much more globalized world. If you talk about a domestic matter, we have to look at the external aspect of it. Any domestic problem is externalized. We know very well in Lebanon, come from a country mm -hmm. that's top on that matter. And any external aspect could be internalized in a way. So in this very complex and complicated situation, Ambassador Cardell, how would we proceed? Mm -hmm. Your advice. Um, I think one of the things that is really important to look at now is, I mean, we have, I work in an institution where over the last year we have seen change that we thought was not possible. The new UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, has achieved 50-50 parity in his senior leadership in New York within a year. And we, we thought that was actually not possible. So I'm, I come from the perspective of saying when there is a will, there is a way. So on the, on the numbers side, it's a matter of, well, if there is a will, it's going to happen. So that needs to be, that we need to continue to have focus on that to make it happen. But I also believe that where we are right now is a place where we can talk about how do we create gender intelligent cultures in institutions and in societies. I think what we hear here and some of the things, Ambassador, that you were mentioning is what we need for our societies to prosper, to, to develop, to be peaceful, to to get the best out of what we have of our resources is to be sure that we have we can get the best out of men and women and men and women working together with the diversity among women, the diversity among men. And the only way of doing that is actually recognizing that we need gender intelligent cultures that allows for, for uh, women to be women, men to be men, but to use that resource, those resources in the best possible, uh, best possible way. I'm absolutely convinced that you will see a different UN now when you have parity at leadership. I really think it takes a lot of leadership to then let that flow. And it gives us, for the first time now, I'm off to New York uh, tomorrow morning, for the first time the UN will gather their female leaders from the field for a seminar, and I'm absolutely convinced that when we get together doing the institutional culture that is changing right now, we will be a part of actually changing this and talking about what is it that a, a gender intelligent culture in the UN can be, and UN being the normative organization, I think it's incredibly important that we take a, le a leadership role in that. So, so I would say let's focus on what it takes to create a, a gender intelligent culture. Thank you. I think our conference is very timely mm -hmm. on the way to, to your trip to New York tomorrow. Ambassador Kirkos. Yeah, let me maybe answer from a different perspective because I understood that generally you were talking about getting as diplomats more into the public sphere, sure. right? So I have to say for Switzerland this is not an easy step to do because you know we have this long-standing humanitarian tradition, mediation, track two. Sure. So for us, it's like a step now to, we do good things and we have to talk about it. We are not used to. So we are in the middle of an of a internal, you know, a little small revolution about how do we get more public in our diplomacy? Because I think this discretion was a little bit our, our brand marking. So this for, for this whole uh, getting public, then of course, I think it's important. It's in, again, you know, you cannot nowadays, when you have presidents who basically function through Twitter, you know, you cannot be absent from the public or social media sphere. So maybe this as a, as a direct um, answer to your question. Yeah. Thank you. You spoke about, uh, of course, a very important track two, track 1.5 sometimes. We have to take our official hat. We all practiced it at one point of time and speak unofficially just to explore possibilities. These are all facilitators. I mean, I'm speaking in front of four distinguished uh, ambassadors. Ambassador Lamoureux. Uh, I, I would very much support what the Pernilla said <coughs> as to when there is a will, there is a way. Uh, there is always uh, improvement to be made on you know, legislations and policies, and that is extremely important work, but we shouldn't wait for that. Uh, to make changes uh, in our organizations and in our environments in general. Uh, when Prime Minister Trudeau decided to appoint a gender-balanced cabinet, it was a decision he could make, so he made it. And uh, I think 
Uh, we also too often present gender equity as a moral issue, which it is, but it's also about smart public policy. Uh, according to our evaluation, in fact, according to McKinsey, narrowing the gender gap in Canada uh, could, uh, could lead uh, to uh, considerable uh, uh, economic gains. And I have the, the stats here, in fact, uh, could lead to 150 billion uh, additional uh, dollars to our economy. Uh, so uh, yes, it is the right thing to do, but it is also smart uh, public policy. Um, and my uh, other advice, if I may say, is as women, we have a tendency to self-censor. We have a tendency to uh, 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 wait for the right opportunity or think that maybe we're not quite there yet or that, oh, maybe after my family, you know, uh, is, is my kids are older. And those are all personal decisions. But sometimes we self-censor for the wrong reasons, not because it is truly what we want, but because we think the world is not ready for us. So in some ways, we can be our own worst enemies. Um, so I would say, you know, uh, uh, setting goals for oneself, for one's organization, identifying challenges and then going for it without guilt or, you know, feeling like you're maybe not as good a mother or not as good a partner. Uh, I mean, it's a personal challenge, but one that needs to be, to be met, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That's a lesson, Lord is yours. No, I, I think very much uh, what Penilla and Emmanuel is also saying this about uh, creating also new mental culture. And I think we are in a time now where things are actually moving faster than we saw for many decades, at least not maybe fa as fast as we would like them to, to move. <laughs> and Penilla and I have been working on this issue for years now, and we know uh, the frustrations that we can meet. But I have to say, uh, like the development you see in the UN, I also work in a system where my two bosses are women, and I'm very proud about that. I have. High Representative Mogherini, of course, who is the EU's uh, special representative for foreign, for foreign policy, and also the Director General in, in our, the EU's uh, Foreign Service, Helga Schmidt. So uh, we're very proud when we come out with these two women. And if you saw all the pictures and photos from the Iran negotiations, those were the two women, and before Mogherini, it was Ashton, who were, who were actually leading from the EU side. And that, I think, would not have been possible just a few, few years back as probably wouldn't have been possible 20 years ago that the four, uh, four of us would be sitting here. So things, uh, things are moving, but if you talk in terms of, of giving some kind of advice, I'm not sure if I'm the right one to do it, but at least I would say um, value and look into public service. Uh, because sometimes in yeah. Lebanon, it's a bit sad when we talk about the public sector and public service, uh, the way that people talk about it in a sort of uh, uh, um, not very nice way to put it mildly and of course this is very much a country that was built on private sector initiative and everything but we need uh, strong smart well educated people also in the public sector doing public service because they want to change things and, and frankly we meet these people all every day women and men who really try to change everything for the better and that's something we need to see much more and I think since this is an election year I have to say not just in public sector but also in politics and uh, Dr. Shiriak was just mentioning in her, her, her introductory speech, it is quite appalling in a country like Lebanon, and you all know the numbers, but we have to repeat them two months before the elections. It is quite incredible that Lebanon is number, I think, 185 in the world out of 193 in terms of the number of women in parliament. Uh, we we're lucky to have one of them with us here today, uh, but still four women in parliament is really um, uh, something that could be done much better, uh, 3%. Is low. We we. It's not like uh, uh, we in Europe are much better. We had very bad f figures for for many years also. But as I was mentioning, things have been changing recently. And I think in general now in Europe, 27 percent of uh, members of parliament are women. And in some of our member states, uh, Sweden and uh, Finland, for example, it's more than 40 percent. Spain is 39. So suddenly things can move faster, but we need that critical mass of women to enter for the first time for it to become more mainstream and more normal. So really uh, just a pledge to uh, join public service, but also for vote women into parliament this time. You really have the chance. Thank you. 
So the degree of representativeness remains a very important indicator. I mean, I fully agree with you and share that with you. Perhaps we can have a couple of questions, but please introduce yourself. And uh, what is Michael? Oh, please. <laughs> I thought you were telling me if you need the micro. And then. No. No, that's. A, Okay. And please, uh, so, somebody. Uh, yeah. I find it controversial. Here in Lebanon, we don't have much women in the. Bravo. Here in Lebanon, we don't see uh, that we have really uh, a big number of women working in the political uh, field. We have much more in the diplomatic field. But on the opposite, when we see how many women are appointed as uh, uh, diplomats in Lebanon, uh, this uh, has a, a kind of indication that means uh, this is really particular. Maybe I don't know. You will tell me uh, if it's true or wrong. Uh, it's, is it the same in the other Arab countries, or uh, women are appointed in Lebanon because uh, uh, the uh, rulers of the world believe that Lebanon is a democratic country, multicultural country, this is why women are accepted in the public world. Uh, it's really controversial. We cannot, we don't know really where to, uh, where we are, where do we stand. <laughs> what do you think from an outside look? It's for all of you, please answer. No, maybe as an outside look, because we have a brilliant Lebanese ambassador in Bern. So actually, the Swiss Lebanese, you know, bilateral relations are in female hands, and we are very proud uh, of this. <laughs> maybe one answer would be, you know, that these women they go through the system, you know, they they, they do a concours diplomatique, you know, they are trained, they are formed, and they probably are outstanding among all those candidates that one day you are making ambassador. So that's what you are saying, right? They believe in, in civil service, you know, they are, they are serving for many years, and because they are so good, they get ambassadors. And now we come back to what you said, Christina, it's about where are all those women who are going to run for parliament? And this is, this is a question I want to give back, you know, to all the fantastic and women that are... What I can see, yes, but there are, my colleagues might know the Middle East better than, better than me, but I think there is a difference. I mean, I have been posted in Turkey, and there are definitely less female ambassadors there than in Lebanon. Uh, if I may add something, we, from my 34 years experience, yeah. in an Arab context, we had many Arab diplomats, ambassadors. I remember in Paris, seven years, 2000 to 2007, when we would meet in Christmas with different regional groupings, we had the highest number mm -hmm. of ladies to gentlemen. Actually, we had uh, a dean of the Arab ambassadors for about 10 years, nine years and a half, who was a woman. So basically, the issue is not as such. Uh, two things, naming immediately an ambassador, non-career, could facilitate matters, but also going through the process of the foreign ministry, and again I say we are very proud to see they were extremely successful in the exams, mm -hmm. and they will proceed uh, with that matter, and really the number of 17 to 8 is extremely revealing about a certain commitment to studying, to progressing, cultural information, so on and so to speak. I'm sorry, floor is yours, Ambassador. Um, no, and all I wanted to say, uh, to add to what's already been said is, is that, well, first of all, I think many of us asked to be posted here, so it speaks to the fact that, uh, well, first of all, diplomats talk to each other, <laughs> including female diplomats, so maybe this is a, you know, a posting that previous uh, female ambassadors have appreciated, <laughs> and, uh, and I was in fact asked, because our, I'm the third female ambassadors to be uh, nominated to, uh, to Lebanon, so I was asked by someone, is it a Canadian policy to only have women ambassadors, and the answer is no. Uh, <laughs> The answer is no, because before that we had a series of, of men. Uh, but uh, for Lebanon specifically, no. But what I will say is that there is still a glass ceiling when it comes to postings. Uh, we have a handful of postings where we haven't had female ambassadors yet. We, ha we are uh, the first female ambassadors to Paris was just nominated, in fact. And, and she's wonderful, by the way, if you follow her on tw Twitter. Name is Isabelle Hudon. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, for example, in Washington, we've never had a female ambassador. Uh, we've never had a female ambassador uh, 
in New York at our mission to the UN, unfortunately. So I'm hoping we will uh, break that ceiling very soon. But uh, when, when it comes to posting in the re postings in the region, um, yes, it, it seems that uh, there is a fondness for, for Lebanon among uh, some of the female diplomats, at least in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> Any comment, please? Um, I, th I think it's, uh, I've served in Egypt as, as uh, the Danish ambassador there. Um, I think, I mean, it looks really powerful because we are four sitting up here, but I'm not sure the numbers are actually uh, adding up to saying there's not parity. There's still a long way to go. Uh, also, also among, among countries and, and organizations to, 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 uh, to nominate female ambassadors to, to, to this part of the world. And then I would very much agree with, with, uh, with, uh, with what was just said about um, the glass ceiling that is that is still there, and I want to also come with a comment. You're you're going to meet uh, Rula Ghani shortly. When I was in Afghanistan, first and foremost, obviously, I was very often the only woman from the international community who was there, uh, because there is this perception back to this that women cannot work there. But we were the Af the Afghan society was moving much faster than the international society. We were often in meetings where there were many more Afghan women than than international women, and that was a part of that change that that Mrs. Ghani has been a been, been an important part of. I think we should, I, I, I know where you're coming from and there's a lot of an internal discussion in this country that needs to be had about what role should women play in, in, in order to, to, to see this beautiful country develop to its full potential. But there's a lot of issues other places too that can, this continues to be something we need to push on. Thank you. I think uh, very much what I agree with what's been said before. I was ambassador to Syria before, and I think we were as many uh, women ambassadors there as, as we, it's the case in, in Beirut. So like Penilla is saying, it's, it's something that we see all over the region. I think that's one of the advantages with this business, actually, that uh, uh, in that sense, we're very conservative. Uh, people follow the hierarchical level. So if you're ambassador, you are the one who has the role, and people would treat you at that, and people Absolutely. would meet you as that. And you go out and you meet exactly, as Penilla was saying, the warlords and everybody else. And sometimes you can even enter, that's the added value of sending a woman, you can, in, in this region in particular, you can enter uh, areas where the men could not enter. So there are some, some uh, positive advantages, including in this region, and I think we actually see surprisingly many re uh, women ambassadors or diplomats in this region. Not surprising, but surprising uh, considering the stereotypes. Uh, but then again, when it comes to the really big embassies, uh, I think we all know the glass ceiling for any of our countries. I don't think any of our countries ever had a woman ambassador to Washington. So um, we can all wish for that. So uh, all of us have a long time, long, long way to go. But, but obviously what's, what's good about it also being this region is you, you actually feel an extra responsibility for also a little bit being a kind of role model because you don't see so many other uh, women decision makers around. Thank you, Madam President. We have four questions. One, two, three, four, okay. No, I have a comment. A comment, okay. And then, and then. Nowadays, you don't have. We used to have political parties, national political parties. I, I'll start by naming the, the Communist Party. Let's say now it's more. It's so much divided that I think it's one of the main causes that women are not going. It, I, I won't make a whole speech about it, but we could have more women. But you cannot hope going to Parliament if at the last months. You decide to go to parliament. You have to prepare your entry to parliament. You have to be active in the civil society. You have to be active in many places. Now, for instance, look what uh, uh, Maishi Jack has done. Now, if she went, okay, I think she is running for elections. Are you no. not anymore? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> no. But people know, everybody knows who is Maishi Jack. We can change but her mind. To come at the last minute, <laughs> and not having prepared your entry, not having worked with the people, not having given your opinion, your political opinion, and you come the last months, it's more difficult. But also the situation in Lebanon, we have 
unfortunately, more confessional parties than transnational national parties, and it's one of them. But for the rest, Lebanon has improved a lot, really a lot. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Madam, yes. Okay. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, one of the last speakers used the word hope. You don't hope, but you say and do something until something happens. Having said that, I was wondering, do you have associations of females, for example, in the UN, associations of women ambassadors, and so on? The idea is so that you guys can come together, discuss, you know, identify challenges and the way forward, and you know, to speak with one voice. Because sometimes women can be selfish with due respect to women here. Sometimes they want to be the first here and the only here. So they don't encourage other women to come on board. So it's very important to have associations so women can come together, meet, and ensure that those that are inside the system are protected and others are encouraged to come on board. Sponsor bills to ensure women participation at all levels, equal participation or at least a very, very reasonable proportion of women participating in every aspect of governance, including policy making and all of that. Thank you very much. Any, any comment, please. I think that's an incredibly good point. Um, one of the things that we did, as I mentioned just briefly before, when I was the ambassador to the African Union, was we created a network of women ambassadors to the African Union. And that network was not a one about hope, it was about do. And, and that was exactly, it was incredibly strong because we were representatives, we were 16 out of, a, out of a 180 ambassadors. So we were, we were a numerous group and we were very representative from, from all over the world. And when we did things together, people listened. We went to, we, one of the things we did, as I mentioned before, was working with the women in Sudan. Um, and we went out to Darfur and talked to the governors there. This, the, I don't think the governor in Darfur had ever before sat in a room. At that point, we were seven of us out there, seven women ambassadors talking to him about the importance of dealing with Sharia law in a way that didn't harm women in Darfur. I think we made an impact on that. So you're absolutely right. These networks can be really impressive. Okay. Please. No, and I was going to say, and increasingly, we have very strong male advocates for equality as well. So I am I'm also part of several uh, networks of, of women, you know, when it comes to, you know, promoting women in business. We have a network of female ambassadors here in Beirut, which, which is a great forum. But uh, we have to remember the, the importance of including men in this, in this discussion uh, because uh, uh, well, first of all, they can be extremely effective advocates. Uh, and uh, uh, second, any, any change with respect to gender equity will have an impact on them as well, which we need to hear. Um, the, uh, I think maybe what is possibly as difficult uh, uh, a task to realize as, as you know, a woman uh, you know, maybe joining politics is, is for a man to, uh, to play a supporting role uh, for his spouse, quite frankly. And, and there is judgment associated to that. Uh, when a man willingly takes uh, you know, uh, the, the second role, it is not easy. And in some countries, it is more difficult than in others. Uh, in our case, we're, I'll talk about my personal experience. My husband is also a diplomat, and we're taking turns, as some people say. So he's a former ambassador to Tunisia. And uh, while he was uh, playing that role, I was supporting him. And now he is supporting me. It is not always uh, easy. There is a judgment of society uh, towards men who uh, decide to play that role. So involving men in the discussion as advocates and as partners is extremely important. And I salute uh, the presence of, of several of them in the room today. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but just a question. Can we take the last two comments? Uh, last, last comment. And, and, and <laughs> okay. My okay. name is Farida Allagi. I'm from Libya. I was the Libyan ambassador to the European Union. I could only, I was able to swallow the, Euro, the European Union only for a year and a half. I resigned. 
Before being an ambassador, I was in the opposition for 40 years. And I have been working closely with the United Nations. I'm sorry to say that our region, I speak about Libya, I'm very critical of the role of the European Union, of the UN, for what's going on in Libya. I just came back two days ago from a tragedy in Libya. And I'm sorry to say that unfortunately, women of principles, women of courage, women who are not seeking positions, are rarely being called or asked to be in the circles neither of the European Union nor in the UN. The Security Council Resolution 1325 has nothing to do with Libya. And I have to say, I do hope that women ambassadors in this critical time in our region have to be courageous. I met fantastic women ambassadors who will speak up even against the policies of their governments. And I am very proud to be an Arab woman. And I'm very proud with the courage of Arab women. But you cannot blame many women for not being in positions of power how we could be representing dictatorship regimes or Islamic regimes or men or men who have been bringing this region to a catastrophe. So it's not a matter of equality. What we have to do now, we can no longer, we can no longer afford to keep this region, and they said it when I was in Libya three days ago, although I'm, I might be again attacked by the radicals, but I have to say, we have not been part of the mess that has come to the Arab world, and I don't think we can afford to seek a, a, a green light from anybody to delve in. I think you will be very surprised, Dr. Aisha Mala from Saudi Arabia. The Pandora box has opened in Saudi Arabia. You will be very surprised with what Arab women will be doing very soon. I was in a refugee camp of simple, poor Libyan women who have been displaced. And what I learned from these strong, elderly, illiterate, poor Libyan women who have been pushed in a camp in a very bad situation while the UN and the EU planning, talking, conferences, resolution, denunciation, enough is enough. Finito. Thank you. Bravo, Farida. <laughs> Last question. Akhir mudekhal sari'an law samahat. Last question, then we have to close. Samir uh, Skaf. Commitments. My name is Samir Skaf. I'm Green Globe President, Lebanese NGO. In our board, we have three out of five, always women. Okay, this is, uh, I have a serious uh, uh, question about a real challenge for you. It's about women, diplomacy, and corruption. Are women more corrupted than men? As a diplomat, <laughs> as a diplomat. Really, it's a serious question. I'm, I'm talking about an experience. As a diplomat, do you prefer to, to be in denial if you face uh, corruption in your structure, or do you prefer to face it? Thank you. Okay, we, if any of the, of our excellencies would like to answer, and we have to close down the session, unfortunately, or to make a last comment. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you on behalf of all of us, our distinguished ambassadors for their comments, their wise comments, and uh, suggestions for the future. Anybody? Like to say something. Well, I can because I had a case of corruption and I, of course, do prefer facing it. It's a very interesting question. There must be a very long story behind the question, but I think, uh, I, think I can speak for all of my colleagues, right? We, of course, prefer facing it. And if I might just say a few things back to you, Madame la Presidente, because don't get me wrong. I think I have just, you know, been a little bit emotional with, with, with the women here present because, as I said, said at the very beginning, Switzerland did a lot in a very short time, and I'm sure that Lebanon is going to outperform us. Thank you. Last, 